So let's kind of jump in and get official. Welcome everybody. And thank you so much for joining Level Up EQ today for our panel discussion on the new normal and how we work post pandemic. Um, the goal for the program today is to facilitate a meaningful discussion, focusing on preparing for the work ahead. Um, as we proceed with our discussion, please feel free to submit your questions using that Q&A feature and we will address your questions live. And as well, we are going to be launching a poll to gain the perspective of your experience. Um, so that's being launched right now. Go ahead and fill out that poll uh, as we're introducing our panelists and our moderator. Um, so I'm going to begin by introducing our moderator today, Marla Skibbins. Um, Marla is the founder of Level Up EQ. She is a master certified executive coach and a senior faculty member at the Coaches Training Institute. Uh, for two decades, Marla has been training and providing executive coaching in both corporate and startup venues, coaching executives and teams. Uh, her 16 years of experience working in Silicon Valley includes working with companies internationally and now focuses on serving executive teams in tech and biotech companies. And I've actually been working with Marla for three years now, and I think she's a pretty wonderful human being, and I'm really excited for her to take over from here. Thank you, Marley, you're such a sweetie. And I so appreciate you. And also I wanna thank Nicole Afton. We could not have done this event without the both of you, so thank you. And Level Up EQ is so pleased to be sponsoring this event because we really are at the crossroads with this conversation about what's next. And my company is about unleashing the magic of human potential and causing transformation within organizations. And right now we are in the middle of that, right? And this conversation will really help us decide how will we create an, the next new normal that supports people. So a few things, please do finish that poll because this is an organic conversation and you as the audience are gonna inform what we talk about. So please finish it. Also use the Q&A and upvote. And I'm so excited to have our panelists and we have a new panelist, Kat Steinmetz, um, who is the global head of talent success at Box, had her second vaccine uh, on Friday and has been down for the count all weekend. So she was not going to be attending, but we have Joe and Joe, I would love for you to introduce yourself. I'll be introducing everybody else, but if you'll introduce yourself with a few words, that would be great. Sure, thanks, Marla. Uh, Joe Ballou, I am a boxer of about four years at the company and just joined Kat's team uh, running leadership development globally for the company. So I have the perspective uh, at Box of having been in the go-to-market org up until about two months ago uh, when I switched over to, to help with this initiative and really excited to share with you some of the things that we're looking at at Box, um, not just ourselves as a company, obviously going through these transitions, but our 100,000 plus customers uh, and all the transition that they're going through. That's great. And I know there are a lot of boxers out in the audience. So please send Kat good wishes and um, healing thoughts. So Fred Kohler joined 23 and Me in 2019 as the vice president of people with a focus on company culture, training, and coaching. He has decades of experience leading HR teams in both biotech and pharmaceutical companies. He's also developed specialties in organizational development and executive coaching. And to top it all off, Fred is a certified life coach. What I know about Fred is whether he's feeding the hungry or working with his leaders, he approaches everything and everyone is a servant leader. Michelle Hart is the global head of people at Samsung Next, where she is responsible for curating every phase of the employee life cycle to promote engagement, performance, and a platform for innovation. She leads talent acquisition, learning and development, human resources, and the DEI disciplines. 
She is a data-driven leader who is passionate about cultivating talent and empowering the employee population to truly be agents of change. And what was immediately obvious to me about Michelle is that to her core, she is a leader of empathy and inclusion. Thank you all, the three of you for being here to talk about this really important moment in time where we reboot how we do work. So let's dig in. So here's our first question. How disruptive has the past year been for you and your organization? And what types of organizational shifts did you experience during this time? And this is very casual and organic. So you just jump in. And if you feel like you wanna to add to what someone else has said, please do have fun. And who wants to start? Michelle or Fred, good. Let's go, go Michelle. No, Fred, you're unmuted, go right ahead, please. <laughs> I just want to get mixing it up right away. So I'm, yeah. taking, I'm just taking my mute off. So it's not like a Jeopardy buzzer contest. Yeah, no. <laughs> exactly. Just keep them off. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I always find this kind of paradoxical. I, I think, in, you know, on one side, I could, I could go for a long time about how tremendously disruptive it's been. Um, you know, if you think about the mental health toll, we just think about, um, we, we just had a, a, an event where we went to the zoo, San Francisco Zoo and people actually saw each other in 3D. And it was this amazing moment. Like you just, you know, like this tears and hugs and, you know, just all that sort of stuff going on. Um, so you, that, that pent up, you know, sort of challenge that we've been all holding. And then on the, on the paradox side, the other side of it is we've been executing pretty incredibly well um, as an as a organization. And so there's, you know, things of focus, um, and as we've seen by a lot of the data coming out of, you know, places like Microsoft, et cetera, people are working harder and longer, which is, you know, good and bad. Um, but in some ways, the execution of our goals and moving the company forward have, has been really tremendous. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for me, it's trying to hold both of those things the ten and the tension that's between those two things. So I'm going to turn it over to Michelle, I guess. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, same for us, Fred. I, I mean, I think we'd all be remiss if we didn't talk about how disruptive 2020 was just um, emotionally for, for all of us as individuals. And, and obviously it impacts the way that people show up at work. I think one thing um, that I would say was probably the biggest change for every organization was that 2020 caused us all to truly see um, our employees like holistically. Um, I think many organizations um, who maybe were made more forward linking, uh, looking tend to be a bit more empathetic. And I think now every employee is requiring, it's kind of table stakes that you allow them to bring their whole self to work. And so I think over this past year, we've done a lot in terms of um, trying to create that psychological safety, trying to make sure that it was a place where employees felt like if there was something that they were struggling with, which frankly, all of us were and probably continuing to be, it was a place where they felt like they could talk to their manager about it, or they could talk to a supervisor and, and kind of have that um, safe place say like, this is who I am completely. And I think um, if anybody thinks that they can separate work and life, they're mistaken. I change from work-life um, balance to work-life blend. I mean, I think to be intentional in words like that, we change from remote workforce to distributed workforce. It's important for us to talk about some of the words that we said. Um, but also, you know, remote um, over this past year. You're cutting out a little bit, Michelle, just so you know. <clears throat> okay. Thank you. I'll shift my head. Yeah, we at Box, you know, we had both the internal changes and then the external changes that we had to process. And for us, we you know, were fortunate to be one of the critical solution providers to so many uh, mission critical enterprises across the world sort of to get through this. Um, but that being said, like there were phases during this whole time. I think initially there was so much uncertainty, right? We, everybody was hoarding hand sanitizer in the beginning and they were, we were being told not to wear masks, right? So the, the kind of shifts from the early days when people went home uh, following an email that came out on a Sunday night saying, we're going to close office for the next two weeks and we'll see what happens. 
and people just grabbed, you know, a, an extra bag of chips and <laughs> forgot to bring their keyboard or things like that to, oh, well, this is, this is going to be the long haul, right? And just that slow un, sort of folding of that realization that, that we, we didn't just have to scramble and, you know, maybe set up a snack tray to work on, but we need to invest in ergonomic furniture. There, th th these were realizations that didn't all happen at once. Um, so in that initial phase, we, we really did try to figure out what we needed to do to support our employees and our customers. We launched a, a campaign so that customers could sign up for, you know, we, we sort of gave like very generous, you know, 90 day like trials of our, our highest tier offering to customers who needed to try to kind of connect their workforce when they all suddenly moved remote. And we gave stipends to our employees to, to support them with the work from home, um, you know, critical purchases. Uh, and that was sort of the stabilizing, right? But then we had the uh, Black Lives Matter and George Floyd and, and these shifting kind of you know, social disruptions that, you know, made us, as Michelle was speaking to, like need to think about how we were connecting with our employees and hearing our employees. And that kind of shifted the focus to everyone's not in the same place. We need to maintain this connection. We need to understand how our people are. Uh, and then I think really as we've entered into 2021 and, uh, vaccines are rolling out. It's now in this new phase of transformation, and like, what is the what is the new normal? As we're all here gathered to talk about that, that we're ready to move into, and it's no longer the patchwork solution, but it's really what's the durable um, kind of kind of go forward. Yeah, yeah, and it makes me think. Though I think this will be our next question: What are the wonderful things? that you want to take from this time into shaping the new normal and what were the difficult things that we're going to have to be looking at? What do we, how do we meet those? But there are gifts. There's also the difficulties, but there, there are gifts that come out that I think can definitely be informing the new normal. Um, I want to check in with Marley. I know we did the poll and we have a couple of questions that kind of point to this disruption piece. Do you have final poll numbers? Um, interestingly enough, it actually looks like about half um, of our attendees have experienced some kind of significant change um, due to the impact. So we were, this was actually a discussion we had prior to the panel is we were curious to see where it would land. Um, only about 25% experienced very significant change, but we're just about half for significant change. And and I'm curious for you you all, kind of pointed to it, but there's a significant human toll that, you know, Fred, you talked about when we finally get to see each other and there's this, you know, what, what are, what are your thoughts about how are we going to, it's almost like heal that because there's a healing that has to happen. And then what are we going to do to create more support going forward, particularly because we're still going to be in this continual change as we change to what's next. Have you thought about that um, and have ideas or? I'll just build on kind of what Michelle was saying too, which is I, I think this time has caused us to be more empathetic and think about, um, and, and Joe's mentioned too, right, of the, the social unrest and the systematic racism and the the different in, differing impact of, of, of this experience of the mm -hmm. pandemic. Um, and I think when you take that all into play, I, I think the gift that's in that, to your point, Marla, is how do we have a more differentiated experience for, for employees? Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that, you know, I think the, it, it, for me, it's about agile working going forward. It's not about, oh, here's the framework that's going to work for everybody, because I, I just think that's too hard for, to predict. I mean, I, I even just to think about myself, you know, it's, that should be an easy one to figure out. Um, you know, I have an hour to hour and a half commute each way to go to work. And so, you know, there's a side to this pandemic that's been kind of nice to be around my family and, and be able to not, you know, miss that commute. That was not a joyous experience for me. Um, so what is it going to be like to start doing that again? And how frequently do I want to do that? And how do I do my job well while doing that? But, you know, can I also have the benefits of being able to, you know, work from home so that I can be, you know, refreshed and, and energetic and all that sort of thing. So I think given that differential impact, given, you know, people's tolerance for risk, as we've seen, given, you know, all of the topics of like, you know, are you vaccinated? Are you not? Will you? We, are you open to being tested if you're not vaccinated? 
Um, I think we're going to have to continue to be very agile in the way we go through this next chapter because I, it's not a light switch. Oh, now we're going to do this and everyone's going to be fine, you know, kind of moment. It's going to be, I think, it's, you know, I, I'm talking about it like an, a restaurant opening, like a soft, a soft opening. Like, how do we do that and get the people who are really anxious to come in, come in? And then how do we do the next phase and the next phase? Yeah. And how do we have a lot of flexibility built into that process? The main gift I think we've gotten is that we're questioning assumptions, right? And I think there were a lot of assumptions for a very long time about what needed to be in person and what you would do in person and how companies should be organized. And um, and this has just forced us to reckon with what it does and doesn't work and where we should allocate resources to try to drive impact for our, for our boxers and for our customers. Uh, and the, the other... Um, yeah, but well, I, I think that's that's one of the, the chief things. Obviously, there's there's lots of sort of savings opportunities when you start to answer those questions. And um, the the commute one is is definitely one in the Bay Area where, where a lot of boxers have felt the benefit of of not needing to do you know three hours a day uh, back and forth. Yeah, I think a huge. <laughs> I, Joe, I completely agree with you, especially with Bay Area traffic. <laughs> um, I, I think a, a huge gift or, or blessing that, that we felt um, was we got to know people um, better, to be candid. I mean, we, we literally in, invited our colleagues into our homes. Um, I, I would sit in a new place and someone would say, oh, is, you're sitting in your backyard today? Or, you know, a, a kiddo would come and jump on someone's lap and, you know, you'd get to meet people's children or, you know, you'd talk about what you were going to be making for dinner that evening. And I, I think it caused us to kind of pause a little bit and have deeper connections. Um, I remember the first time we tried doing a strategy session, I was like, how am I going to facilitate this and use like Miro or a mural or this and that to try to um, recreate a whiteboard or like going up and putting post-its up. And, um, you know, we did a, a virtual like paint session where everybody got canvas and, and, and ended up like painting from their homes and showing each other. So I think it caused us to be creative. I think it caused us to have more personal connection. Um, but I also think with that, you know, there was a lot of anxiety around 2021 and people starting to get um, vaccines and people saying, well, gosh, now what? What's going to happen? Um, am I going to have to go into work five days a week? What does that mean? What's the plan? And so it was important for us to put together a distributed workforce policy as quickly as possible. And one of the things we noticed is, um, you know, it's, it's different for our global offices. In our Tel Aviv office, they meet every Monday and Wednesday. Everybody is vaccinated and they break bread and they have a meal. And that community is incredibly important to us. Mm -hmm. In our Korea office, everyone comes in five days a week in mass, even through the pandemic. And that is, you know, the way that they function. So in the US, we just recently decided that we, you know, we're not going to reopen our brick and mortar office in San Francisco and New York. We would keep our Mountain View campus open, but it would be optional for people to go in. Otherwise, everyone could remain distributed five days a week. And to Joe's point on saving cost on kind of commercial real estate, we're investing it instead in, you know, bringing people together and having really meaningful in-person, you know, all hands or retreats, so to speak, um, you know, that we can make really meaningful experiences for people. Um, so that was kind of where we landed. Yeah. And we're, uh, I will be unable to share our, our plan because we're still in the process of making it. One of, one of the things though that we realized in so many parts of our business and, and our customers are doing versions of this too, is sometimes you just don't know the answer and so you have to pilot something. So this summer we'll be piloting some of the um, sort of reopening um, approaches. And, and we just completed a global survey of all of our boxers and asking lots of detailed questions about what their preferences were and what their considerations were um, and what their intentions were. And, and that's, that's informing it. And then one of the just absolute non-negotiables is that we'll be building our policies around the best available science, right? And of course there's always uncertainty there, um, right. but in terms of when we're justifying a decision or when we are um, just trying to come up with the best solution uh, for, for the company, we, we need to, to okay, have safety first and, and have that be informed by well, what we do know. So, uh, we, 
yeah, at this point, we're still in the US fully remote, um, but we will be beginning uh, sort of the process of reintegrating into, into the uh, hybrid in person in the coming months. And Fred, answer that same question. How do you envision the new normal? What does it look like for your organization and for your workforce? What would you say? I think it's very similar to what Joe's saying in terms of we're doing pulse surveys right now to get a sense of where people are. And then, um, you know, kind of like Michelle's situation, you have to kind of look at the different cultures and what's happening. Now for us, we're, we have two sites in the Bay Area. So it's not dealing with, you know, like uh, Korea or Israel, but we've got one that's a lab-based space and we've got one more that's a GNA and office and you know, software engineering uh, sort of space. And so those are very different needs. And so similar to Joe's thing, you know, we're gonna be moving faster in the therapeutic space because that's right. really important for us to get the experiments um, to, you know, they've been um, running throughout um, the pandemic, but we wanna probably have more people in that office, but that allows us to experiment, get it right, learn from that experience before we, you know, turn to our other site in Sunnyvale and, and kind of go from there. So, I, I mean, I think in general, I imagine a hybrid world, we, we've, we've basically said to our employees, um, it'd be you know, good to stay in this kind of 150 mile radius so that you can come in if we need you to. We still believe that um, being able to collaborate in person is a, is a powerful thing. Um, at the same time, we were um, much more of a, you have to be in the office to do work kind of place before the pandemic. Um, and I think now, you know, with this massive human experiment that we've just had, um, it's obvious that we can get a lot of work done remotely. And so I think we're gonna have to have a, a blended sort of hybrid approach to doing that. And it, we too haven't exactly nailed that down yet. We're right now in that process of working with the employees and talking with executives and seeing what makes the most sense. Yeah, I'm really appreciating um, the willingness to, and Fred, you and I talked about this, the dance of, well, we're making this up as we go along and, and that it isn't just you've decided in your HR world or people world, this is how we're doing it. You're dancing with the other, you're dancing with those folks out there that work for you and saying, how will it work for you? How, cause, cause they've been a part of this. And I think that is also a really beautiful thing to see that. And I think you are all leaders that probably do this, but it's asking your workforce because that's empathetic. That's something that if you ask and you meet them at least part way, you're going to have so much more engagement than if you said, here it is, and you're going to do it. Um, so I can really. And, the, and yeah. just building that, Marla, I think that's great. And there's a tension in there too of like some of our employees, they want us to declare so they yes. can plan their lives. Yes. So like we can't completely just waffle forevermore. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think of one population, um, and Michelle was talking about, you know, parents, right, where, you know, they're, they've got to figure out what is the, the scheme that they're going to use to take care of their kids, or they're, you know, and they don't know necessarily today, are the kids going to be back in school? How much are they going to be back in school? So what type of flexibility do they have? What, what systems and structures do they have to create? And so I think there is a tension to, we got to be somewhat declarative yes. so that in, in advance, months in advance of that kind of September timelines so that people can make good decisions for their families as well. And Fred and Joe, I don't know if you saw this trend. I know we've seen it at Samsung Next is there's a lot of people who want to move to more affordable places since we are saying that we're distributed. And so another thing that we had to look at, um, and we definitely did pull our people and, you know, we always tell them they're agents of change. And so we want to make sure that, you know, this is where we can show up and, and actually show that. But, you know, we talked about localization and we talked about, you know, if they are going to be moving countries or entities or, you know, are, am I going to adjust compensation depending on where they end up going? And I mean, there was a lot of back and forth on that. Um, but ultimately one of our favorite phrases are you spoke and we listened. So every opportunity we can, when we get feedback, we try to close the loop and say, this is what you said. And then this is what we ended up doing with what you said so that they can feel like there's more validation when we, we pull them in the future. That's great. And what Marley, I, I want to check in with you. Are there questions that go in this thread of what we're talking about that you can have the audience ask? Yeah, absolutely. So there's actually one from David that's wonderful that I think should be addressed, which is... Um, 
How will you prepare those people leaders who will now need to manage an equal mix of on-site and off-site teams? Uh, the looming proximity bias and in-group, out-group dynamics keeps him up at night. Any ideas or practices in this space would be greatly appreciated. I'd love to take this one. I'll say that this was something that we spent a lot of time on in 2020. In fact, we um, ended up facilitating a training on how to lead distributed teams just for individuals who, who were you know, may or may not have had the experience even to, to lead in person. Um, we have individual contributors that had moved to leadership roles. Um, and now just to kind of add insult to injury, now I'm saying, all oh, your people are distributed, what do you do? So, um, you know, we started doing some training in 2020, but now um, we're starting kind of a, a series in 2021. And so we have um, empathetic listening and emotional intelligence and how to lead distributed teams um, how to give constructive feedback, how to facilitate one-on-ones. And then we're having a full um, academy essentially that our leaders are gonna be going through and kind of get certified, so to speak. And as new leaders are coming in, that's going to be um, the standard that we hold. And um, as time goes on, of course, as they continue to give us more curriculum that they wanna learn, we will build it and customize it. We really want it to be um, you know, a living organism, so to speak, but we feel like, your middle management is really going to be the make or break on, you know, engagement and performance um, in, in this hybrid world. Yeah, I can share on this one too. Um, that was great to hear, Michelle. Um, I feel like we, we've we got to do more practices exchange after uh, outside the call. So we, we keep learning that. from each other, but so glad to be here. Um, so I think one of the first things we, we actually had made an investment prior to COVID around, uh, I mean, Box is really known for its culture, but it was around um, the way we build sort of our DNI program. And so our foundational training courses, these in-house courses that we like really invested in, and we did bring in some external consultants to help build, like focus on overcoming bias and focus on situational leadership and really people-centric uh, sort of horizontal people management skills, right? To make sure that our frontline managers and, and their managers have the tools to deal with all the varying circumstances that happen that you that you encounter when you're managing people right so we, we already had that foundational curriculum but it's become all the more important in this environment as situations are so varied and 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 circumstances are so inequitable and so that's sort of the first step and I think now we're looking at you know what does inclusion look like in this new environment is it is it getting everybody together in the same place because that's when things are fair or is it being you know really leaning into high uh, hybrid or remote because people are in different places, right? And and it's more fair to, to accommodate that. And um, it's helpful to establish sort of what our policies and procedures are where there's appropriate flexibility in there too for the, those that decision-making that's localized. Uh, and then for those people who need to make those localized decisions, they need coaching. So one of our big investments is around how, how do we make sure that as many managers as possible have access to coaching services to help them sort of in real time, do that um, scenario, you know, situation-based uh, response, right? And, and really address that because our curriculum is never going to achieve that. So while training is important and policies are important um, for all the things that we want to decentralize that decision-making, people need to be equipped to process that decision-making um, with support. So that's a big investment for us. Yeah, and it's, it's fascinating. We've got these th three different companies and we're going a similar path, right? So, you know, next Monday, I'm excited. My learning and development person is coming on board. This is probably similar role to you, Joe. Um, and um, we're definitely trying to figure out what are those core curriculum pieces that we need to do. I, I do think it is going to be, I, I worry about the rubber, I think it's the same as the author of that question, right? The rubber band problem, right? Which is we've stretched this rubber band and we're all, you know, on Zoom and that works. We're on a level playing field. And now this hybrid thing is going to be this yeah. mix of in office, you know, and we all know what that feels like to be the, the one person or the two people on Zoom while everyone else is in a room. Um, and do we, does the rubber band snap back to, oh, we'll do it like we used to do it, which is we'll ignore the two people on Zoom and we'll just get on with the meeting. Um, and so I, I do think it's going to have to be this, how do we set up an environment where people can coach in the moment, can raise their hand, can challenge and say, hey, this doesn't, this doesn't work. We've got to, you know, have a different, you know, what are the practices we're going to have that are going to create more of a hybrid thing? I was talking to one person and we were like, well, maybe we should have Zoom on in the room 
you know, not just up on the wall, you know how it is, you project up on the wall and there's one, you know, far away and they can't see you and all that. Maybe we all have our individual laptops open and they're like, well, that would be weird. Like, well, maybe that's the weird we need, you know, kind of to make it more inclusive so that that person can feel, can raise a voice, can be involved in the conversation. So I love, I love, we're going to have to feel weird because this is a whole, again, I have to want to keep pointing out, it's this new thing. And this is another, it's like diversity in another way. And we have to start thinking about how do we have to get uncomfortable in order for there to be more global comfort for the whole group? You know, thinking about how things get done, you go on break and you talk about it. Well, maybe we don't do that anymore. Well, you know, we're going to really yeah. have to drill that person, David, that said it's keeping me up and I, me too. How will we <laughs> yeah. make sure that people feel included in, in the, the, the cultural fabric, right? The, and the, the team fabric, because things get done in the old way. We can't do that anymore if we're really going to truly embrace a new normal. So I, I, I love that. Um, I want to check in Marley from the poll. There were a few questions I think that pertain to envisioning a new normal and what does it look like for the workforce? Did we have some sharings there that we can post out? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the more interesting one actually would be around company culture and overall team health. There was a really significant split. So we had 34% of folks say that company culture had somewhat approved. 27% that said it had not changed and 36% that said company culture had actually declined. And I'd be interesting to the follow-up, which we don't have, which is what happened, you know, what happened that had it decline. And it's interesting, is culture an office? Is, you know, is it, what is, what is culture? And I think it's a feeling. And how do we create that feeling? You know, whatever your culture is, whatever the being of the organization is, how do we create that? You know, if it isn't a place. I used to be a history teacher in, in a prior time and taught high school kids about what culture was. And and I see it showing up in, in the corporate life that it, you know, starts with values, but then it sort of it then it, it's sort of gets ingrained through customs. Right. So, so many of our customs have been incorporated into the, it, when we were all work, working in person, into these ad hoc um, kind of face to face whiteboard sessions or coffee chats and things like that, which are really hard to replicate in, in digital or in, a, or in a hybrid environment. Right. And I think where, where we've tried to be attentive to two different aspects of, of how to preserve culture and leverage productivity that's fully inclusive are one, like a lot of those ad hoc workflows really ought to be more systematized and like design the process and run the process, right? And more more and more of our business units have business unit specific PMOs and are getting more kind of defined around what the the governance is on projects and program management and things of that nature. And on the flip side, you have the need to be like, build the interpersonal connections and connect with people. And so we've rolled out trainings around with, you know, setting agendas during meetings is really helpful to make sure those are purposeful meetings if people end up Zoom fatigue, but also at the top of that agenda is checking in with your people, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Or when you roll out a project or a program and you're doing team building, like what are good team building exercises and what tools do we have, right? And so you have to explicitly carve out time for people to meet each other and check in with each other and show what's behind them in their backyard or show their kid and, or ask them how they're getting through things. And then when it gets to doing the work, the work has to get better organized. It can't just all be ad hoc um, because just dealing with everything that is a repeatable business process in an ad hoc way on Slack, it burns people out, right? Yeah, I think, um, I, I definitely think culture is is um, organic and is created by our people. I mean, I, I consider things like values, guardrails, so to speak, but ultimately, um, 
I used to say when I was at a hyper growth startup that like the, the new 50 hires were the ones that would end up creating the culture. Like every 50 new people, it like it iterates a little bit and that culture isn't something that scales, it evolves. Um, and that you need to be able to understand kind of the pulse of the people to be able to give them what they need. And so, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to build a culture that was pre-COVID. I'm, I'm trying to make sure that I'm serving our people of where we are right now. Um, to Joe's point, I think business norms are really important. Um, we are making it a point to say that when people are out, they're out. Here's the person that you can go to. We're not reaching out to them on Slack or email or anything else. I've had managers say like, if you sign online, I'm going to, you know, change your password for the time that you're off. You need to make sure that, you know, you get time with your family. And so I think leaders really showing that it's important for people to kind of disconnect and recharge and, and leaders doing it themselves, I think is really important. Um, I start all my one-on-one -on -one sessions with one to five where are you today? And it's brought up a lot of conversations personally of what people are going with. Today I'm a two, but it's because of X, Y, Z. Like today I'm a five because of X, Y, Z. And 99% of the time it's personal stuff that is causing them to give that rating. And then we go into wins and literally on a weekly basis with everybody on, on my direct reports on my team, they will talk through their wins of the things that they're really proud of. And when I first started the practice, they were like, I don't know what to put. And now like I'll go into a meeting and they have four 14 things that they have written. But, um, you know, I think, you know, we started putting more of a focus on asynchronous work. We started providing clarity on what the tools that we were going to end up using. We started um, archiving a lot of our Slack channels that like didn't exist anymore so that it, there was more organization to it. We started doing more vlogs in terms of like, here's a quick loom update on something that was supposed to be a meeting, but here it is. And then you can add a comment, like things like that and making sure that all leaders were doing it collectively as opposed to one off where if I'm working with Marla, I do it one way and I'm working with Fred, I do it another way. Having that standardization, I think has really caused people to feel more heard and acknowledged and, and feel like work was a bit more manageable yeah, and held. Yeah. 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 I want to, I want to check in Marley. Do we have um, other upvoted questions that you want to throw into the mix? Uh, we do have one that's actually at the top right now. It's um, on the same page, a little bit different at the same time, but how do you bat and this is from Anna Wilson. How do you balance being agile and piloting, trying various models with feeling a need to reduce employee stress related to the ongoing changes in the workplace. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I think, you know, part of it is like knowing different parts of your organization and where pilots would be more receptively kind of taken on. And so, you know, kind of working with those kind of early adopters and, and trying to figure it out and, and test it out. Um, so, and I think the constant, you know, we're doing pulse surveys now to try to find out where people are and where they're feeling stressed, et cetera. That gives us a little bit of insight into, you know, what's going on for different groups. Um, but I, I would say, you know, and maybe it gets back to the culture thing. There is some emphasis on, okay, what, here's what's not changing, which allows people then to feel anchored and kind of solidified. And, and it's some of these principles or values that we're talking about, um, whether it's, you know, for us, Similar to, you know, what Joe said earlier, we follow the science, you know, that we're a science-based company. And so that's really important for us. Um, or we're in it together. And even though that's like been on every billboard, it seems like since the pandemic hit, um, we had it before. Um, and we really <laughs> believe in that, you know, in the way we talk about it and bring people through it. So I, I do think it's um, helping, you know, identifying those populations that can move and then also helping people understand what will be the same, what will be consistent trying to tell people like well in advance, like we're, you know, we're trying to give people at least three months before we shift something so that they have a chance to be able to plan, get their heads around it, have conversations with their family, that sort of thing as well. Uncertainty isn't new in business. And a lot of it is the same timeless principles of leadership where you're communicating a vision and you're, you're sort of engaging your people, right? I think we, we try to set out like this is the North Star that we're going towards. These are the criteria we're making a decision by. This is when we try, we're aiming to make a decision by, right? And, and sharing the information and allow people, even if we don't have a final policy rolled out, 
and or, or you don't necessarily know how you fit in. You don't know if your specific role, your specific team is going to be five days a week, three days a week, or fully remote, or if it's optional, or if your salary is going to be adjusted. You know that like these are the parameters. This is the timeline. This is how we're making the decision. This is how we'll cascade it. Right? And like all those things could be established earlier on and communicated widely. Um, we can enable our frontline managers to 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 handle those conversations also when they when there's more follow up. Right? Publish an FAQ. Make sure the CEO or, or the, the line of business like VP is able to send out a comm where they're representing sort of the best understanding we have at that time of where we're going, right? And that communication cadence is super important. That's great. Okay, so I'm gonna ask you the last question, which are, and you've been speaking to some, some of it, and I wanna see if there's any more just when I ask the question. What are some of the workforce challenges you are working through to minimize disruption and maximize productivity? That hits you differently than the questions we've been talking about so far. We're calling, I think in terms of, oh, go ahead. no, please Joe, right ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, we're calling 2021 the great shuffle. Like that there's, there's so many people who are, who are there's a lot of opportunity with with a lot of new money in the marketplace and, and sort of a glimmer of hope. And so and boxers are highly desirable on the marketplace. So so we're trying to make sure that that our people feel like happy and want to stay and want to keep mm -hmm. building their career here, which is, is, a, is a challenge when there's lots of abundant opportunity externally. And um, and but with every so I think our, we're, our customers, our partners are seeing the shuffle, too. And so just having that awareness, like we're trying to get as much as possible ahead of succession planning and identifying, you know, risks and, and, and uh, where, where we have single points of failure in the business and, right, and just being able to plan for those, those inevitable shifts and those shifts that we're seeing. Um, cause that's, that's a challenge that hasn't really come up yet, but I think is, is, um, a lot of people hunger down in 2020, right? Like yeah. if they had a job, they were lucky to have a job and now it's, it's, the possibilities are opening up um, or people are just feeling ready for a change. Uh, and so we're trying to make sure that, that that's something we're aware of and planning for. Yeah, I wanna, I wanna speak to that because I think there's two things you're pointing to. One, that shuffle is people have gone all over the globe, right? Because now it's not geographically located. And um, I read a, a report coming out of Morning Consulting that was done for Prudential. 42% of people in that report, you probably all read it, right? Will leave their current employer if they take away that ability to be remote, to work, um, remotely. So I think we're going to continue to see the shuffle, both because people will want to work remotely and just because like you're saying, there's more opportunity out there. So I'm curious, have you seen that the um, Michelle and Fred, have you seen that shuffle some or are planning for it? We, we haven't seen it so far, but I think just in terms of talking to, to colleagues in, you know, the HR, um, you know, industry in general, everyone's expecting much higher attrition rates this year. Um, like Joe said, everybody was hunkering down in 2020. I think now a lot of companies um, feel like they're more stable, have the ability to be able to open more racks. And so our, our people very well will be getting poached. Um, I, I feel like the resignation is when it's too late. So proactively, what we're doing is starting to meet with our leaders individually and say, great, let's go through your team and let's look at what are each individual's motivators and drivers? Like I expect every manager to be able to articulate their employees, motivators and drivers. And then from there, figure out what is an individual plan for each of them to figure out that they feel like they're being, you know, validated, challenged, that they're learning, that they're, they're being, you know, they're growing and being fed, frankly, on a day-to-day -day basis. And then in addition to that, from a leadership level, our executive leadership team is meeting and figuring out um, kind of what Fred said, how do we help them feel anchored? How do we give them stability? How do we make sure that even if it is an evolution, and Joe talked about this as well, that we're helping them understand what we're working on as it's going. Um, and so, you know, I think a lot of it is just frankly an open dialogue. I don't even like using the word transparency because I feel like it's kind 
kind of a, a coin term. It's not a one-way communication. We're very much listening to our people. And yes, we're doing pulse surveys. And yes, we're doing our engagement surveys. And yes, we're doing focus group discussions where our people business partners are pulling groups and, and talking to them. But it really is depending on our leaders because that's what they're supposed to be doing is going to them and saying, no one knows your people better than you do. Um, talk to us about kind of what their needs are. And then we've been really having that inform what our plans are. So one of the things that we got from our team was, you know, kind of where are we on our mission, vision, and values? Like, do we feel like they still resonate? And you know what? They may not change. They may change. I don't know. But us being willing to go through the exercise with our people and not just in a vacuum with our leadership team to say, let's evaluate each of these things. Let's do the workshop. Let's have the focus groups and then see where we end up on the other side of it really makes them feel empowered and a part of something bigger. And so that's something that we're launching um, right now. And, and frankly, if I, if I had to guess, um, I know this is being recorded, I would say probably values will be the one that changes more so than, than mission and vision. I think we have a really good alignment around those two things. Um, but again, I think it's just making sure that they feel like they're agents in change, uh, of change and, and a part of the, the dialogue. That's great. That's great. I want to, I want to grab one more question, um, from the audience. You said you had a couple of interesting questions. Which one will you grab, Marley? Um, well, I have two. So if we have time to get to the second one, it would be great, but kind of bouncing off of what Michelle was saying with bringing in the dialogue, we have a question from Rob that mentions that their org closed all their physical offices in March of last year, and they've remained remote this entire time. The executive is divided on whether or not it's smart to pull the employee base about their desires to return um, to work, uh, or whether they're going to keep remote, um, fearing that they might find them evenly divided. Um, he's curious to hear if you've relied on or feel that polling employee sentiment is a smart way to make the decision. Well, I think with that, with polling, always you got to have an expectation setting. Like you have to say that, you know, the decision is still held at the executive team, um, taking in all the different considerations. But I, I think it's, um, it's more scary not knowing what your employees are thinking and then making a decision and then finding out. Um, and I think we have similar tension. I mean, I think there's different leadership styles, right? Which is kind of like, hey, we know it, let's go and let's, here's, here's the path forward. And that's what leadership looks like. And then I think there's, you know, more of a uh, let's poll and see where people's points of view are and, and take that into account. And, and I, you know, I'm, I lean towards the more empathetic leadership style, which is I'd rather know how people are feeling and be able to accommodate that and come up with a better solution. Um, I'm also very, I, I like to be very clear with expectations saying we're doing this, but we're, it's going to inform us. It's not going to decide it for us. We're not just taking That's a right. poll and then creating the policy based on the poll, because you've got to take into account business considerations, financial considerations, the executive kind of visions and where they're going with their various teams, the different needs for the different teams. Um, so I think you need to set that out up front say, hey, there's going to be many inputs, one of which is employee feedback, as opposed to it being the sole driver. I would just check to know what you think you need to know and what you would do with it if you knew. And if you can't answer those things before you send out a survey, you shouldn't send it out. <laughs> like, what do, you, what do you think you need to know and what will you do when you know? And, and chances are, if you can answer those two questions, you're gonna send the right questions out to your people that will be well received. And so I agree, I always tell leaders, don't ask for feedback unless you're willing to take action on it. So like, if you already know our decision is going to be to turn right and you're just going to pull for the sake of polling, don't do that. It just, it creates more damage. But I think the other piece of it is I'm a strong believer of wherever you land, share your why. Like, like Fred said, there's, there's business, you know, needs, there's financial needs, there's this and that. Like, I really recommend if leaders can to share, this is why we ended up here. We pulled you, this is what you said. And then this is ultimately why we made the decision. Even if it's not in agreement with what the results of the poll were to be able to show them all the factors that went into consideration, it helps them understand their leaders more and you know helps educate them to be you know shareholders in the future. And again, like feel very empowered. I, and I wanna say all of you are speaking to being in a relationship as opposed to a unilateral, here's how it goes. And I think we've had to be in a relationship much different through 2020 and now into 2021, where we're considering 
everyone, not just the business, not just the shareholders, not just, we're considering everyone because we all have to do this together. And I'm really hearing that uh, very clearly in what you're all saying. Um, and and it, we and have to remember bring, this, this is a relationship we're in with everybody. Yeah. You know, if, if we bring in the obvious too, which is, you know, the diversity part of this, um, you know, I just think, you know, as a white male in, in my fifties, making assumptions on how everyone else is going to react to it, it's a pretty dangerous ground to, you know, kind of start on. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, well, you know, so. I think it is different maybe than maybe some executives have kind of learned and grown up and, you know, gotten to the positions they're in. Um, but I think it's a, it's a much more powerful stance to be like, all right, let me really understand the nuance of what's going on, the diversity of experiences that people are having right now and incorporate that and then the position that I'm going to then hold. Yeah. That's so much more engaging. Because if you consider me as your employee and you've asked me and you've treated me like an adult and explained that this is how it's going to go and I'm not just going to decide it through my own lens, that there's a bigger lens and you've communicated with me, I feel so much more included in the business and created from instead of here's how it has to be and it's much more of you know that kind of top-down management. And I think the more sophisticated now we're going to be having lived through this, you know, time, we're not going to be willing to just be managed and told what to do. Uh, well, so. and to the trends, you know, conversation we just had, right, you know, I just came from a Josh Burson was doing a keynote last week. And, you know, the, the economic uptick that's about to happen and the pressure on, on talented people, which we all have the pleasure of working with every day. Um, I think yeah. it's a really dangerous position to be in an arrogant stance of yes. like, they'll just stay. So, you know, we're doing some, you know, the same things. We're, you know, we're very much mission driven. So trying to keep people focused on that. We, we are actually, you know, going towards a SPAC um, in, in, the, in pretty soon time for us. Um, so that's exciting news for folks. But at the same time, I think you can't just say, oh, we'll get that going on. So therefore people will stay forever with us. Um, I, I think you really have to have the conversations and be thinking about what's next and how do we keep developing and growing our talent? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm not sure we have what I, I don't want to I want to get in that last question because you said it was interesting, but I'm so let's be let's be bottom line with our answers, but let's get in that last question from the audience. So this one's really top of mind right now, but um, this one's from Renata has the requirement of having received a COVID vaccine being a factor to reopening the office. There's many pulse surveys right now that say employees are only comfortable going back if they know peers are vaccinated. Yeah, I mean, we're right in the middle of this. We just polled, we get fortunately a pretty high number. We had like 98% said they either had a vaccine or they're getting a vaccine. So I think that puts us in, in a pretty pretty powerful spot, which is, which is lucky. But we are trying to think through all the different scenarios of if you don't wanna get a vaccine, because obviously that's a legal um, possibility um, for either health reasons or religious reasons, et cetera, um, then we've gotta be able to accommodate them. But then to your point, you have to think about the health of the overall site. So can those people work from home? Can we have you know frequent testing that would help? So I, I think we're trying to work through all the various scenarios and, and also just find the populations and what sizing we're dealing with before we get to the ultimate answer. Yeah, yeah. Yes, it's an, it's an interesting time because we want, I mean, there's so many different places to look in inclusion and, and how do we do that? Whether it's teams that are not together or people that will or won't get vaccines or whatever it is. It's like, how do we keep including and dancing with this uncertainty and yet, you know, take keeping everybody safe and taking care of the culture. It's a very interesting time. Uh, and I want to say- part of it too is giving voice to those different things. You know, let, let each of those populations articulate their concerns. Yes. So it's not like execs were deciding this. It's, you know, here's, here are your coworkers. Here's what they feel about safety. Um, and now how do we as a community move forward in a way that's going to be, you know, the safest for all of us. Yeah. Um, so because these are, as we've seen with this entire pandemic, there are no easy answers here. We it's really just trade off decisions and how do you manage the different risks. Well, and let's, let's not forget that we don't just interact internally with each other, right? We interact with our customers and our partners. And, and actually, that for many of our employees could represent the vast majority of interactions that they have on a regular basis. So in, in those circumstances, are where, where do we stand in terms of 
in person or masks or, or vaccines or anything that provides comfort and safety uh, for our people while enabling them, while, while providing that same level of service and consideration to all of the stakeholders. And, and that, that level of complexity is part of the reason why I don't have like a really simple policy to walk through with you today is because we're, we're really considering how, how we're trying to solve for an ecosystem of people. Yeah, thank you. I wanna just thank you because we're gonna wrap. Thank you panelists for both your transparency and your willingness to, to show where you are and that you're in the process and where what you're seeing about what's happened with your organizations. I really appreciate your honesty and your candor. And I wanna thank the audience for your participation. That was great. Your questions were awesome. So appreciate you being here. We will be doing other events like this. Level Up EQ will be sponsoring them. Um, please follow us so that you can know what's next. And I'm, I'm just, I'm taking away from all of your comments that, you know, this, it, it's like the dawning of a new way to be in relationship together. And that we can no longer assume what is going on with people. We have to actually be in a relationship with them and ask them. And I, that makes me really excited because I know relationship is a huge uh, engagement lever. And if we can be more in relationship with the people that we lead instead of just leading them in a vacuum, we're going to get so much more magic out of those people because they're going to feel included and created from and, and, and connected to. So um, I'm thrilled to hear uh, your organizations leading the way for that kind of relationship um, to happen. So thank you for that. And thank you for all of the participation. Thank you for your kind attention and your learning out there. Uh, in the audience, and we'll look forward to you all going out and creating magic with those you lead. Thank you so much, and have a beautiful Thanks, rest Mom. of the day. Thank Thanks, you. Joe. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Thank you, Fred. Thank you, Take care. Thank you, Marla, and Level Up EQ. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Take care. Thanks.